Welcome to the next Pivot Point podcast. This season, I am focused on sharing stories and ideas from global experts on diversity and inclusion. My purpose is to share diverse stories so that you can learn from others' lives experiences and walk away with actionable strategies to lead even more inclusively. I share this information because inclusive leadership is a journey. It requires bravery and courage, and you do not have to do it alone. At Next Pivot Point, I believe we are stronger together as allies. Let's meet this week's guest. Welcome to this week's episode of the Next Pivot Point podcast. I am excited to be joined with a friend and colleague and ally. Natalie Siston is here with me today. And Natalie's career has taken her from Silicon Valley to the Fortune 100 and into entrepreneurship. But being raised in Republic, Ohio, population of 600, yes, (laughs) is where she learned her greatest leadership lessons. Natalie uses these lessons learned from small town living to help leaders and organizations create big success in the world. In addition to being a 10-year 4-H member and repeat state fair champion in public speaking, Natalie is a two-time graduate of the Ohio State University, Go Bucks, and professional coach accredited through the International Coach Federation. She has 20 plus years of experience coaching, developing leaders, and strengthening teams in the nonprofit, higher education, and corporate sectors. She works with both one-on-one and small group coaching clients to help them be more connected, to be themselves, that live their work, families, and communities. She is a frequent speaker at leadership, university, and corporate events. She resides in Columbus, Ohio with her husband, Rob, and two young daughters. Natalie, so good to have you. I'm so glad we're doing this. I'm surprised it's taken us this long. I know. We've known each other for many years. So for our listeners, um, I'm a Buckeye uh, and spent some time uh, in corporate America at Nationwide Insurance, where Natalie also worked until recently when she started her coaching and speaking business. And she's kind of had it as a side hustle. And so over the years, we've had a chance to talk and uh, brainstorm ideas. And she's been really helpful in connecting me with amazing people. uh, And I've been thankful to help her um, with her new book. It's so exciting. So let, let's start the conversation there, Natalie. Let her out, listeners, is the book that you got to get. Um, Natalie, where did you have this idea to write this book and like tell us what it's been like to write a book? So the book writing process is interesting because a lot of people have asked me, how long did it take you to write the book? And I said, well, there's two answers to that. I said, one answer is that it took me uh, six months because I, it was April of 2020 when I actually committed to writing the book and it was published in November. I said, or the answer is 32 years because it's based on the diaries I found that I've kept since I was eight years old. So Let Her Out came to me in November of 2019. I actually pitched the idea for a TED Talk in Columbus and thought like, this is my TED Talk. You know, it was, I was almost ready to turn 40. I'd found all these journals and diaries and, and the title just popped to me, like, Let Her Out, Reclaim Who You Have Always Been. Because when I started opening the covers of these diaries, I'm like, she is who the world needs more of that bold, sassy, confident person who somehow over the years has just kind of beat herself down and not shown up fully. And that's a great TED talk. And then I was rejected. Um, So it didn't happen. And then I quickly pivoted and turned it into some keynote uh, pitches. And I ended up getting it accepted to four different stages in the spring of 2020. And then those all got canceled because of COVID. So I I had a decision to make, you know, because I hadn't written, like, let's talk about being a speaker, like you make a title in a 30 or 100 word description, and then you write the presentation after you get accepted. So I hadn't written the presentation, (laughs) I just had it accepted all over. And I thought, well, I can either just throw this away and forget that I ever had the idea or I could do something with it. So I I invited whoever wanted to come to a Zoom session in April to listen to my keynote. I actually made myself write the keynote and delivered it. And the next day I got on the phone with a book coach, Kathy Fiock, and I said, I think this is my book. Can you help me with it? And within the half hour, we had the outline written for my book. That was in April. And um, I had a first draft by Memorial Day. I had a final draft by Labor Day. And then I was out in the market in November. So, wow, I didn't realize it happened that quickly. I know. I mean, and when I was in it, it didn't feel like it because it was all I thought about. It was like all consuming. Like, I should be working on the book. It I should is. be editing the book. But for me, it was more of a curation because I, the hardest work in writing the book was reading all the diaries. 
I would sit down at my computer with a diary in my hand and all these colored coded post-it tabs. And I would be typing out certain passages that I thought reflected certain themes for the book. And I had, I've already written, I'd written a blog since 2016. So I had a lot of great material that was there. Um, and a lot of just, uh, you know, f- so tip for people who want to be f- future authors, even some of your long social posts, you know, those things you, you, you say, those have, those turned into book content. So for me, it was like putting this big puzzle together of what is this message I want to share in this book and how do I put all these p- great pieces from across my life together to share it and, and then add on the cherry on top of like it being a, a life coaching book and have over a hundred coaching questions sprinkled throughout. So for me, it was just, it was a fun experience of like putting something together. I like to solve problems and this seemed to be like the ultimate product of that. Well, for so many reasons, I think this is so, um, may resonate so much with where we are right now. Um, out of a pandemic, right? Something positive (laughs) came in. This is a great success story of gave you the time to dial this in, to go through those journals and how that must have felt to connect with your eight-year-old self. I I can only imagine, Natalie, what that would be like, probably laughter, tears, probably everything in between. Yes, all of it in between. I think what's especially interesting is my daughters are eight and 11. So I was thinking about them in the context of what I was writing at the time. And I was like, do they have a crush on a boy right now? Do they like, you know, are they having body image issues? Are so it's helping me with my parenting because I'm finding ways to ask those things without feeling like I'm intruding in their privacy or wanting to read a diary they're writing. But um, yeah, but I also just, you know, feel like we're living in a different day and time where there's no way my daughters have a crush on a boy right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. They couldn't possibly. <laughs> we don't see any boys. So why would they? Or, <laughs> right. or girls, whatever the case might be. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, because we know doing the work that we do with women and confidence Confidence peaks at age eight. And when you think about when you found those journals, that's not true for every woman, obviously. And it's true sometimes for men as well. But a lot of the research from the book Confidence Code, I thought was really helpful a few years ago when I was helping women with confidence. Wow, at age eight, that's deeply disturbing and troubling. And why is that? It's not a biological thing. It's a socialization thing. Start teaching girls at that age, body image, be smaller right? You want to be skinny. My, my daughter's already said things like that at age six uh, because of what you see projected in the media, um, what you see on television. Um, also, we know for kids of color, you don't, you're less likely to see yourself reflected. Women or uh, girls are less likely to see themselves as a protagonist in a movie. Um, they're doing better, I will say. Still a lot of work to do in books and all sorts of things, but these images are fed to kids. And then to your whole point, like I was, I was, intact. It was this good human, right? And and what it took to like 32 years later to like go back to that, like the person you've always been is who you are, but people lose sight of that later in life. So give us a window into some of these coaching tools for people that might be on the verge of a midlife crisis or you know, just a <laughs> pandemic. Like, who am I? I know a lot of people are like, who am I on the other side of this? It's a great moment for pause. But it's hard work, you know, it's introspective work that we help our clients with. What are some tips if you're wrestling yeah, with dialing oh, in? I love the question and you're exactly right. Like it, it is ironic titling a book, Let Her Out, when we're all feeling locked in. So it's like, read the book now. That way, when you can actually get out, you're like, this is who I'm letting out. I'm letting her out. So the her is is you at, at, at your core. And I walk everybody through four steps in this book. And they each come, like I said, with work, you know, worksheets and everything's available for download on my website. Go check it out even without the book in, in hand. And the four steps are to remember her. So that's really the visceral, like, you know, I'm going to go find pictures and remind myself what I looked like. What did my smile look like? Where was that glint in my eye? Um, You know, how was my hair cut and that bowl cut (laughs) type of thing, but really just finding yourself in in photos and even in images, if you don't have them of yourself, of, of people at that time to remind you of who you were and what you're experiencing. 
and reminding yourself of the things you really loved doing at that point in your life. And then the second step is reconnecting. So if remembering is like finding the surface, reconnecting is digging at a deeper level and getting you back to your bones. And so for me, that's where having a diary was extremely helpful because I was able to read the emotions I was feeling, you know, when, you know, I experienced the death of a classmate when I was in sixth grade and I wrote about that. And, and obviously I can still bring myself back to that moment just because it was such a big event, but reading it in the diary that in the pen, that I wrote when I was 11 brought me viscerally back to that moment. So we need to find ways to reconnect to the emotion of who she was, because if we can, you and I both know if we can, you know, think and then feel who she really was, she's more likely to show up at the surface. And then the big work is in the third step, which is recognizing and re removing barriers to her. And that's where you and I both coach hard and know all of these confidence issues come in. It's the fact that we have built barriers ourselves, either directly because our brain has told us to, or society has told us to, or maybe there truly are hard and fast barriers at play. Maybe there's a time, money, access issue going on. I don't ever want to downplay that. A lot of times those are the easiest barriers to get, to get over because once we tell ourselves, I want to get over it, we'll find a way to find the money, find the time, find the help we need. But the other barriers are all the things we know and know and love, imposter syndrome and need for recognition, need for acknowledgement, um, coming face to face with our own imperfections. And, you know, I tell everybody in the book that for some of these things, I'm still working on them. It's a daily like chipping, chipping away day by day. And other things, it's those barriers have been totally torn down because I've chosen to. And once we remove those barriers, we're in a place where we can let her out. And that may be in a, in a, in a motive state of how we show up. It may be in a confident state. We're more free to speak our mind. Uh, and it might be in a, what we're doing to spill it, fill our free time. You know, I have coaching clients who have returned to things like playing the piano and painting because they, they know that really helps them be more of who they are. And they're finding space and time and resources to do that in their busy motherhood life. Mm, well, and now being trapped inside our house, <laughs> and well, yeah. let out <laughs> the irony of that, I appreciate. But you know, think about the things that you really enjoyed as a kiddo. There's there's clues everywhere to who you are, if you really are willing to look in the mirror and dig deep and find them. It's funny that you say that about the piano, because I, I found my old keyboard. <laughs> from elementary school and it's like 1980s keyboard you know everything you'd expect and my daughter started to play with it a little bit it's kind of fun to see that you know see yourself continue and um, find old movies we've gone through old movies that she that are relevant to her like the lion the witch and the wardrobe we've been watching that series and I read those books in second grade so it kind of takes you this nostalgia factor and I appreciate what you're saying because when we travel back in time and kind of think about who we were, you know, emotionally, spiritually, like what we were into at that glimmer in the eye that you said was, it really does help you dial in with like who you are. I, I haven't changed that much. Now the bowl cut, I can res like that resonates with me. I did have a bowl cut. Um, and I know oh, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> like, thankfully that is no longer, although a lot of things with the 80s have come back. That is not one I think we need or the big hair, but Natalie, I'm curious, knowing I talk a bit, um, a lot about diversity um, and the work that you do, you know, small town leadership, like you grew up in a town, 600 people. Um, we're at such a crossroads in, in diversity space. You know, most of my clients are on the coast. They're not even here in the Midwest. They're on the coast, bigger companies that know the power of diversity and they're global. So they, they've got to do it. Um, they're getting pressured to do it from their stockholders, whatever it is. I don't see that same thing happening here in the Midwest with small to medium sized companies. Like, yeah, it's a nice thing to do, um, especially in rural communities. You know, my clients that reside in rural communities will say this is a really tough conversation to have. I'm curious from your upbringing and vantage point in rural America, what, what do you think the deal is with diversity? So I'll, I'll give you two perspectives. So about two years ago, so this is before kind of everything we experienced in 2020 um, with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, et cetera. Um, yes, this was two years ago. I contacted the principal at, at the high school I went to. So I graduated in a class of 88 people. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this work, I want to understand what's happening at home. I want to understand because I don't live there anymore. I want to understand what's facing these kids right now. And so what was really refreshing, Julie, was when I asked them what they feel like they're missing most growing up in a small town and what they're looking forward to the most when they're going to college or moving away is diversity. 
hands down, these kids said, we feel like we're missing out on diversity and we look forward to moving to a place or going to a college where we can experience more diversity. So that to me was so refreshing to hear because going from a town of 600 people to the largest university in the country was like, whew, you know, night and day for me. And, and I was very fortunate to grow up with parents who were accepting of all. And, you know, I think the hardest part and why there's this big divide, Julie, is when you don't see something, it's not, it doesn't matter to you. And, you know, I'm not saying anything that your listeners haven't thought about before, but quite literally, I grew up in a town where there was zero racial diversity, absolutely none. Um, Anybody who might have been LGBT was either not out of the closet, or it was a just like a speculation or a a rumor type of thing. There wasn't, that was not a thing that was happening in the 90s when I was in my formative years in that town. And I think that just all pervades, right? It just stacks on top of itself for generation over generation. It's like, it's not my concern. So I'm going to make it, I'm going to diminish the importance of it. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to choose instead to say things like all lives matter instead of at least recognizing that there are people in the world who are having a different experience than me and I should care about it. So I think we have an empathy divide that's happening. It's, you know, the, there are hard things happening in rural America. I mean, let's, let's be honest about ourselves. There, there are very hard things happening in rural America. The access to even things as simple as internet, like you and I take for granted, they don't have as you know, easily. And just, you know, when I go to my hometown, it's depressing because I see the house that used to be the center of town falling apart. And I don't know the reason why. I don't know if it's the fact that that, that person passed away and the house just never you know, never changed hands or what, or if it's that the people that are living there now can't, you know, don't have the means or the care to, to upkeep it. So I think it's just really, we just keep telling ourselves the same stories. And for your clients who are on the coasts, they're all talking about different stories. And for the people who are in smaller towns, rural areas, they're talking about the stories of things that are happening there. And there's such a fear Um, So it's an empathy divide and it's caused by so much fear. Like, I don't understand who these people are that they're talking about because I don't see them every day. Therefore, I'm going to choose to either not care about them or I'm going to choose to make them my enemy. Yeah, it's fear, right? We, what we don't understand, we fear, right? And this is a primal human thing. I, I, I like to fit in things into categories. So if I'm not familiar with this category, I've never experienced this category, never met somebody from this category. There's, and I don't have empathy. That's a key ingredient. Not You can be willing to empathize and learn. If you choose not to, fear will override that. And it leads to some problematic behaviors that I think we've very much seen in the news cycle over the course of the last year. And I'm glad you addressed that because it, it's hard to understand what we haven't experienced. And that's where the curiosity and the empathy as an ally is so important to be willing to understand things that you can't possibly fully understand. And that's why it's always a journey. <laughs> I'm never going to be the perfect ally. I'm never going to know what the lived experiences of people of color are. I'm just not going to ever know that. And I would never pretend to know that. But it does require me to put myself in pretty vulnerable positions. Um you know, to think about growing up with zero people of color, that is just so fascinating. I grew up in central Ohio, not too far from where you grew up, but more towards Columbus, which is a more diverse city by way of the university mostly. Um, And it was still, I want to say 15%, maybe 20% people of color in my high school graduating class, uh, which is actually pretty good um, by standards today and, and better actually than where I live now. Because most communities, 75% of white people grow up in white dominated communities. So how are we going to understand each other if we, we can't access each other? We can't go to the pool together. We can't go walks together. We're isolated. We're still separate. So all of that, I think, is, is even exacerbated when you talk about rural versus urban. Natalie, I'm curious when you think about um, the other side of this, you know, hopefully at some point we'll be on the other side of this pandemic. What are your hopes for people? You know, you do a lot of workplace consulting and help people bring their full human self to work. Like, what do you hope we learn from this? And what do you think the future workplace looks like? I mean, I, I, ho- well, I just got a little chills because I was thinking about that. So I hope for two things. So, and it's funny, I conclude the book by writing a letter to my readers and actually write a, three letters to various types of readers in the end. But my, 
my letter to the main reader is my wish is for all the women in the world to let her out and experience her fully. And I asked a group of my group coaching clients what the world would look like if that happened. And some were the very much like, you know, we're going to live in a world where there is equality, there is confidence, there is justice. So, you know, the things you and I would think about. And then there was another person who was like, it looks like a field, a green field with blooming flowers and a blue sky with perfect clouds. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, and this is my, this is my artist in the group saying that, but I loved that visual because I just think we need to embody what is it going to feel like when she's alive? And for this person, that was her visual. And for me, it's like dipping my, my feet in the sand and feeling the ocean waves on them. Like that's what it feels like to be free and out. Um, so that's kind of the overarching, you know, wish I have and thought, but in terms of like what the workplace is going to look like is, is the workplace is going to look a lot different, especially for working moms. Um, we've seen them be affected more than any other population in this pandemic. And it's interesting because I made my career pivot during the pandemic. And in some ways that was helpful because I could all of a sudden I was my own boss, but I think we're going to come back to a workplace where it is more flexible. I think a lot of workplaces have talked about flex schedule. And that means like you can pick the one day a month you work from home or you can pick the one day a week that you come in at 9 a.m. versus 8 a.m., right? And come on, give me a break. Like that's not flexibility. And I think now people have learned to work with whatever they have. You know, if it means they get up at 6 a.m. so they can work from six to nine, get back offline to help their kids with school, get back on at noon. And then, you know, I think we're gonna live in a world where those things are okay because we're seeing people perform as well, if not better in this environment that they have in an office. So I hope we come back to a workplace where a manager can look their employee in the eye with full trust and say, what does effective work a work life look like for you? And if I come back to you and say, it means I work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for 10 hours, and I work four hours a day on Tuesday and Thursday, and I'll occasionally check in on the weekend, like that, let that be a good thing. So I, I just hope, I hope this helps us redefine flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that because we've been arguing for flexibility in the workplace as, as women, especially women, you know, 70% of women in the United States are primary caregivers. That's just where we're at right now. And we're seeing that completely um, overwhelm women in the workplace with unemployment numbers staggeringly higher staggering. I mean, we're talking like 10 X higher for women than men. So something's going on on the other side of this. What an opportunity to think about how we can balance work and life or not even balance, just integrate them to your example about that work week and, and challenge our listeners. You know, if you can influence HR policies, <laughs> try to really push on this policies. They're like, yeah, one day a week you can work from home. I, I used to have that. That was the example I had in my last corporate job. That's not real flexibility. Like you still want to control me. <laughs> That's not so rigid. Right, could, because then that that's the assumption that I can only be effective in the office when I'm just pissed off when I get in the office because I've, I've been stuck in traffic. I had to get up when it wasn't my time to get up because I work better, you know, starting at 10 a.m. And, you know, granted, I'm not expecting like this total free for all. Like we have to have some guardrails, but it's like, let's help. Let's all work together to create what those guardrails are. And if we can be effective at them, we're going to have a level of trust in our organizations like we've never experienced before. Yeah, um, yeah. I, that was my experience early in the pandemic was just that there are there are managers that just aren't trusting. And they're the ones who were like, this, this is horrible. And we need to get p- people back to the office as quickly as possible. It wasn't because, oh, we need the great ideas. We need the socialization. It was more like, I don't know if people are getting their stuff done. And I'm thinking, hmm, well, that's probably the bigger opportunity is to actually assess that versus making an assumption that this person's sitting around watching daytime TV. Right. <laughs> and just because their their butt is in a seat of an office chair in the <laughs> office does not mean they're working, right? Right. Like, I don't know how many times I'd be done with my work. And then at the end of the day, I'd be like, okay, well, I guess I'll get on Facebook for a little. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. I have to stay here all four, so I'm just kind of killing some time. And that kind of ticks you off, right? Like, I got my rather time. left. I would have been right. rather just left and then gone and got picked up my kids and hung out or gone to the gym and gotten a workout. So right. But yeah. this thing you have to see people, and that's really been upended. I think everyone would agree on the other side of this, that good managers that trusted their team to get their work done and held them accountable and could measure work not in inputs of hours, but an in output of actual work 
succeeded in all of yeah. this. Conversely, there are a lot of teams that fell apart when they didn't have trust and they didn't have that communication. That was already a problem before, it had nothing to do with the setting. So appreciate that perspective, Nellie. Well, tell our listeners, um, kind of, I, I guess, one key message. If you could distill all the things you've learned from your entrepreneurship journey from this crazy pandemic world to birthing a book in a pandemic, <laughs> what's one key message you think will really resonate or one thing you'd like people to take away from the conversation? So I'll connect two things we've talked about. So, you know, I have followed this path that's been burning inside me for a long time. And we also touched on the idea of fear when it came to, you know, this small town experience and the line that was the most important for me in this whole journey was recognizing that moment when my dreams were greater than my fear. And that is when I knew I could go be whoever I wanted to be in this world. So I think for those listeners who are sitting there struggling with identity or showing up fully, it's to fully assess what am I afraid of and work every single day to face that fear, to talk to other people, to put shine light on that fear. You and I both know once we shine light on something, it tends to go away or diminishes pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And it takes the power away from it. It does. It take it, it, you know, you, you, you take the power away from that fear, but step forward every day to make those dreams greater than that fear. And when that pivot happens, then you're going to be looking at her or him or they in the mirror. Oh, well said. So I kind of visualize dreams greater than sign fears. <laughs> That's a good vision board uh, post. Yeah, and I, I identify with that as, you know, somebody that's had, I've had my own business now for six years and I finally getting a team around me, which is great to have that support. Uh, you kind of get that imposter syndrome though kicking in every once in a while of like, uh, am I like really able to do this? Like, why should I be the one to vocalize something about diversity and allyship? And I hear those little thoughts in the back of my head sometimes. And this is a good reminder of like that dream is bigger than that fear, which almost every day it is, but it still, it still affects us, right? Like, even though we teach about this and write books about this, like I still feel fear. Absolutely. It's just how you power through it. Like how you take the power away from it, labeling it recognizing it, practicing some intentionality on it. I'm, I'm studying meditation right now and doing terrible at it, but I know it's a good tool. So I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> but Natalie, it has been so fun to be with you today. Thank you for all of the great wisdom you shared, um, all of the information and in your journey, window into your journey of starting a business in a pandemic and these great coaching tools you have. Tell our listeners, how can they get in touch with you, where they can follow your work? I know you've got those coaching worksheets. Where can they get them? Absolutely. So go to letherout.com. That is the site for the book where you can figure out where to get the book. I got some fun options on my website for you to get signed copies and other fun swag. And then I also have a ton of great free downloadable resources there to help guide your journey through that book, book club guides, those types of things, even some fun social graphics. Uh, so letherout.com is my little beauty of a site. And then I'm Natalie Siston on all the places. So I'm the only Natalie Siston, S-I-S-T-O-N. So uh, LinkedIn and Instagram are my two preferred hangouts right now. That is awesome. Well, listeners will link to that in the show notes, letterout.com. And be sure to follow Natalie on social media. She has a great, great doses of positive energy in your social feed, which I think I always appreciate. Thanks, Natalie, for your time today. I was happy to be here, Julie. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you listening to this episode. If you like this podcast, the best way you can be an ally is to write a review on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Every review helps other allies find us. I host this podcast because I believe we are stronger together as allies.